Ready? Ready. Ready. Follow the Olympic Road. Hey, and we're here, and we're live. <clears throat> All right, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, we'll get started. Thanks for joining us at home. If you're there at home, <clears throat> if I'm talking to the ether, don't wake me up. All right, well, we have some of our troops are at the uh, Monmouth County Fair tonight. Man in the, man in the, uh, man in the, the, the booth there. <clears throat> it is an amazing, amazing spot. We've gone there three years, and uh, if you've ever been there, we've had, there's this German juggler. He's called, like, Silly German Juggler. And he gets this amazing crowd. He like juggles fire. And we've always been like far away from him. We're like right next to where he is. So there's a huge crowd of people near us. And it's so much to praise God for because it wasn't the spot we picked because it's a lottery. First they stuck us way far away. And we were like, all right, that's where the Lord wants us. And then they moved us a little closer. We were like, okay, great. And then a couple of weeks ago, they're like, do you want this spot? We were like, yes. And uh, even somebody else, there's another quote-unquote Christian ministry around there, and they were like, how did you get this spot? And you don't want to be smug and be like, Jesus, but, you know, it was really, it was really a huge blessing. It was just, a, it's amazing. Yesterday was the first day. It goes tomorrow, or it's happening now till 11, if you're crazy like me and are contemplating driving there, I'm not sure. Uh, Friday, tomorrow, it's 4 to 11. Saturday, it's 11 to 11. And then on Sunday, it's open till 6. So, like, I'm going to maybe shoot out after the service and catch the last few hours and then break down. Um, so, those are the hours. Uh, if you are going, contact me or Eli because we do have, like, some passes to let people in or out. So, you don't have to pay if you don't want to pay. So, uh, if you're going to be at the booth, you can kind of get in um, about that. Um, but yesterday was the first day, and they said, they sent us email updates. They said there were almost 21,000 people that went through the turnstiles just on the first day. It was, that was mammoth. That was really, because they estimate about 75 for the whole fair. So if that's the first day, they're going to exceed expectations. And just everybody was out. People were there. There was some uh, good conversations. A lot of tracks went out, stuff went out. So looking forward to more of that. And uh, tomorrow, though, we also have uh, the ladies are getting together in the evening. Uh, at 7 o'clock, they'll be studying Sarah. Um, which sounds exciting. My wife is putting some stuff together. So if you have questions about it, contact my wife. Uh, they're going to meet at Kathy's. They'll have some food, some time in the Word, some fellowship, and uh, keep that in prayer. And ladies, if you want to join, if you have questions, contact Danielle. And then in a couple of weeks, we got our Kids in the Garden, uh, which is coming along really wonderfully, praise God. And I, I'm seeing our first T-shirt, uh, Hot Off the Presses here. It's uh, that good? That looks good? I feel like those old TV shows, like, am I in the camera now, right? Uh, wise builders, God at work. Uh, what else does it say? And then on the back, we got our verse. Uh, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. So uh, that's the whole theme. That's the thought of it. Everything is building. And uh, I'll just put this here for a second. And uh, really excited about it. Keep that in prayer. And uh, if you have any last minute folks that you want to join, let me know. Uh, we have a good group of at least 18 or 19 young people showing up, so pray for their souls. Uh, we have a great group of helpers, and uh, we got a, a theme that really excites me. Like just uh, and like every, I went crazy. I bought decorations the other day. I was like, oh boy, it was bad. I got construction vests for everybody. It's going to be hats. It's, um, I, it's probably a problem. Uh, and then on the 28th, at the end of August. We're planning on having a baptism, and we've got four, maybe five folks lined up to be baptized. And what we're going to do, Lord willing, is have some refreshments after, uh, afterwards and have some lunch in the cafeteria. So we'll be sending an invitation out that if you're able to stay for a little while, uh, that would be a blessing uh, for the folks getting baptized just to uh, support them and, and encourage them. So things to pray about. Pray for the fair. Uh, just pray for just some great open doors. Pray for some big things to happen. Uh, I'm just excited about this fair this week. Um, I texted out today something errantly. Alexis uh, Elias, who is um, Mike Murphy's, Mike and Nile's niece, uh, she's expecting, and she's being induced actually tomorrow. So just keep, I said it was today, I, I got my message crossed up. So she's getting induced tomorrow, so just pray for her, pray for strength for her body, the Lord to work all this out, use it for His glory. And uh, Brother Danny's having a procedure uh, this upcoming week, so just pray for Danny. Uh, what is it? August 2nd. August 2nd. So pray for him just to get some, you know, it's an oblation, right? Just an, 
an ablation. So I just pray for him and get his AFib under control and feel a little more comfortable. So pray for our brother. So, all right. Um, pray for Eli that he doesn't get in a fight with a guy about the King James Bible today because he's uh, this guy was needling him last night. And so I said, play nice today, but uh, he may let him have it. Um, but uh, let's open. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll open up our Bibles. So Lord. Uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your wonderful mercy and love and goodness. Oh, Lord, you daily just load us with, load us with benefits, Father. And I want to praise you today, Lord, for just the ability to stand here, the privilege of handling your word, Lord, the honor of just being in your service, Lord, whether it's to hold a cup of cold water, teach a Sunday school class, fold up a chair, Father. You said we part alike. Lord, I just pray like you just thank you for bringing some people, Lord, whether they're at the fair tonight or they're here tonight, just want to love you and serve you and learn your word, Father. So I pray for the brethren at the fair, Lord, give them unction, give them souls, Lord, give them boldness and power that only you can give, dear Father. We pray for our dear sister Alexis, Father. I pray you touch her body, Lord, strengthen her as she prepares for this time, Lord, this time uh, that can be painful and difficult, Lord. I pray you would be as easy as possible and that your hand might be evident, Lord, that her and especially Caesar might see your goodness, Father, lead some to repentance. And Lord, we pray for Danny, Lord, for his upcoming procedure. I pray, Lord, it will be without incident. It will be successful, Lord, and he'd be able to serve you with all his strength as his heart's desire, Father. And help us, Lord, guide us into the book of Joshua tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're, uh, we're going to start the book of Joshua. And uh, I always, in, I've been endeavoring, uh, I endeavored to get through a book in a week, and I've, I've thrown those aspirations overboard. Um, eventually, when we get to like Obadiah, I think I'll do, that in a, I'll do that in one week. But just too much good stuff. So, hey, Joe. Um, we have some handouts. If anybody needs extras, job, Chris has got them. Uh, we got out, and they're two sided this time. We got uh, the basic breakdown on one side. I'm going to mention the path of the second advent. So there is like a map with the path that Jesus Christ takes when he returns on the back. So that's yours to keep. And I'll clarify some of that. So let's go to Joshua chapter 5. Let's start there in Joshua 5. All right, Joshua 5. All right, Joshua 5. All right. Joshua 5. All right, so let's go over some vital statistics. I don't have the whiteboard tonight, so I'll just say these. Uh, some vital statistics for the book of Joshua. There are 24 chapters. It's not in there, Stephen. I'm sorry. There are 24 chapters. There are... Hey, you want a pen? All right. There are 658 verses... There are 18,854 words. Josh counted them all himself. All right. Please notice, so that's 24 chapters, 658 verses, 18,854 words. Please notice that it is the sixth book of the Bible. And the sixth book of the Bible is the first book of the Bible named after a man. And that man's name is J-O-S-H-U-A, six letters. So the sixth book of the Bible is the first book of the Bible named after a man whose name has six letters, just further confirming that the number six is the number of man in the Bible, right? So your sixth book of the Bible is the name of a man which has six letters. The sixth book in the New Testament, jumping ahead, is also has six letters, the book of Romans, which means pertaining to the people. So you got to watch that number six. It's the number of man. Now, historically, let's get the history of it. Historically, it's Israel entering the promised land. Amen. So it's an exciting book to, to read and, and to think about inspirationally for you and me as Christians who are not Jews under the law, but inspirationally for us, it's about you claiming some of God's promises to slay the giants in your life. It's about you getting victory, about you getting all God has for you. I've really enjoyed the study of the book of Joshua more than maybe ever any time I've gone through it. Now, what about doctrinal? What does it mean for the future? All right, well, I'm not going to flip there, but if you want to write this verse down, there's some great parallels between Israel in the tribulation and Israel right in the beginning of the book of Joshua. First parallel is that they're in the wilderness. 
They were in the wilderness in the past, in the book of Joshua. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, they've been hiding in the wilderness. It says that that woman in the tribulation flees into the wilderness for three and a half years. So there's a parallel. Here's another parallel. The nation has had Moses preaching to them in both places. In the book of Joshua, they've just come after the death of Moses. Moses has just preached to them, and Joshua is getting ready to take them into the promised land. Well, guess what? You know who's preaching for three and a half years in the tribulation? Moses. <laughs> Moses is preaching again to the nation in Revelation chapter 11, and again Moses will die, and Jesus, not Joshua, Jesus will take them into the promised land. And just like only Joshua could take them into the promised land in the past, only Jeshua, Jesus, is going to take them into the promised land in the future at the second coming. That's why Joshua 5 is where we're at, right? Verse number 14 and 15. That's why Jesus Christ is pictured in the book of Joshua as the captain of the Lord's host. He's pictured as a warrior. Because he's going to take, he's going to go to battle in the past, and Jesus Christ is going to go to battle in the future. So that's why Jesus Christ is pictured as the captain of the Lord's host. All right, it's right there in verse 14. Joshua sees Jesus, and he said, Nay, but as Ca Jesus speaks, as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? So Jesus there is showing up as this warrior. He has a sword in his hand, and he's coming to deliver Israel. All right, so um, let's talk about the basic breakdown. Now, again, I don't have my whiteboard, but you have this on your paper. The basic breakdown is very simple. Chapters 1 to 12 is divide and conquer. It's all about the conquest of the land. And any good general, any military strategist knows you divide your enemies and you conquer. So they're going to divide the land up and they're going to conquer it. That's the first half of the book. The second half of the book is divide and colonize. Now they're going to move in and possess the land. They're going to start to take that inheritance for themselves. So the first half of the book is a lot of fighting, a lot of conquest, a lot of battles. Second half of the book is a lot of colonization, a lot of taking over, going up into the land and receiving it. So let's jump into chapter 1, and let's jump into some of the great Bible pictures and some of the blessed Bible truths. I mean, it's rich, brethren. I really, I'm excited about the book of Joshua. I've been excited about all this study, but something about this book of Joshua has grabbed my heart and it's challenged me, and I hope it challenges you in a good way. We're going to get through just the first seven chapters today, and we'll try to finish it, Lord willing, next time. But uh, chapter one, the great picture of chapter one of Joshua. Again, where are we going in Joshua? We're going into the promised land. What does the promised land represent for you and me? Not heaven. It represents a place of blessing. It represents a place of victory. So if you want Jesus, Joshua, to take you to a place of victory, you better pay attention to this book because it's got all kinds of nuggets and chock full of truth for you to grab hold on and get to that place of victory in your life. If you don't want to get to any place of victory, just sit back, relax, the air conditioning's on, we'll be over in a little while. But if you want to get to like higher ground, this book has a lot of stuff for us here and I think we need it. So chapter one is this, it takes courage to stand for God. That's the great truth of chapter one of Joshua. It takes courage to stand for God. You know what God has called us to do? He's called us to stand. It ain't much. He just called us to stand. You read through Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians is a great book of spiritual warfare. In chapter 6, he zeroes in on the armor. and He starts talking about spiritual warfare. You know what he says in that chapter on spiritual warfare in chapter 6? The Holy Spirit tells us what? Stand. Stand, therefore, having done all to stand. Now, Joshua is a companion book of Ephesians. Because Joshua is a book of spiritual warfare in the Old Testament. And he starts by talking about courage. Because it takes courage to stand. That's why the book of Joshua starts with this admonition to have courage. Let me show you. Uh, look at chapter 1. Do you know, you want to write this down maybe, of all the books of the Bible, Joshua mentions courage more than any other book. It mentions the word courage or courageous seven times. It mentions courage or courageous four times in the first chapter. 
because this is the key to getting to the place of victory. You've got to start with courage. And look at Joshua 1.6. Let me show you some things you need to have courage for. Joshua 1.6, the Lord is admonishing and exhorting Joshua, and he says, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. You know what you need to do first, brethren? Number one, it takes courage to believe God's word. Because some of it's fantastic. And most of it, if not all of it, flies opposite of all the philosophies that you've been raised to think. Some of us didn't get saved at five years old in Sunday school. Some of us lived 20 years or more as an idiot, and we've got all this bad programming. And you know what? You've got to like deprogram and reprogram and renew your mind. And God says it takes courage to believe God when the world says you're crazy for thinking that. That's the first thing you've got to need courage to do is just to believe what God has said. Number two, look at verse number seven. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And this is a very famous verse. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Number one, we said it takes courage to believe God. You know what it takes courage to? Number two, it takes courage to obey God. God's saying there in verse 7 and 8, you need to observe to do, observe to do, observe to do. Hey, Joshua, you need some courage to follow what I'm saying, to obey what I'm saying, to keep what I'm saying. Flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let me show you a contrast. Let me show you a guy who did not have any courage. He didn't have the guts to believe God. His name was Saul. You know what a lot of Christians do? A lot of Christians are like Saul. They pay God lip service. Oh yeah, I trust you, God. Oh yeah, I'm doing the best I can, God. Oh, I'm trying to follow my Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Saul. Saul paid lip service to God. God says, no, man, you need some real courage to really stand for me and obey what I'm telling you to do. Saul didn't do it. You want to see what Saul had to do? 1 Samuel 15, 3. 1 Samuel 15, 3. The Bible says, he commands Saul, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman, people that are fully grown, infant and suckling, things that are yet growing, ox and sheep, camel and ass, things that occupy you, those are the work animals, um, I'm sorry, camel and ass, and those are the traveling animals. So pretty much he says, destroy everything. Wipe them out. They're wicked. Remember Amalek, type of the flesh? Wipe out the flesh. Have no confidence in the flesh, the Bible says. Don't give it an inch. Get rid of all of it, Saul. So what does Saul do? He does what a lot of Christians do. I'll do a little. I'll do some, but I'll tell God I'm doing all. Oh, I'm sold out. But you only give God a little bit. Look at verse number 13. See it? Samuel shows up. And Samuel came to Saul and said unto him, uh, Blessed be thou of the Lord. This is what Saul says. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Really? I don't know about that. 13 is the number of rebellion. It's interesting he says it in verse 13. Because in 14, Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? That's a great message to preach, the bleeding of the sheep. right? God tells you to do something, and then you hear, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> What was that? Man? No, no, that's nothing. Don't worry about that. Right? What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, watch Saul, right? I want you to notice, Saul didn't have the courage to obey God all the way. The people intimidated him. He saved what the people thought was best. See what he says? He says, they, they meaning the people, have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. You look at verse number three. Is that what God told them to do? 
God said, utterly destroy Amalek, smite them, wipe them out. The people said, well, not all of it. Some of it's good. Some of it's nice. Let's just get rid of the bad stuff. We'll, dr we'll dump out the drugs. We'll get rid of the booze, except, you know, on Friday nights. And we'll do all that other stuff. We'll get rid of everything but the stuff we like. And we'll, you know, we'll save the best. God says, that's not what I told you to do. Saul, you're a coward. You're a coward, Saul. You not only ran the bus over your own people. You didn't have the guts to do it yourself. So you said, all oh, the people, the people. But you're the leader. I told you, Saul. That's a good lesson for dads everywhere, right? He said, oh, my kids are like this. My kids are like that. Yeah, it's probably your fault, buddy. Because God told you to lead the house. God told you to take the reins. And don't just throw them under the bus. God's going to hold you the most accountable. And God's holding Saul accountable. Look what he says in verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. You know what that's telling me? It's what a lot of God's people do. A lot of God's people, and I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir tonight. Maybe it's you at home. Right? A lot of God's people don't have the guts to just obey God. Just get some guts, ask God for some guts to just do what God said and, you know, come what may. Saul wouldn't do it. Saul's like a lot of Christians, just willy-nilly, half in, half out. God says you're going to do it or not. Utterly destroy. That means completely wipe it out. I'll go back to Joshua 1.9. It's a great, great verse, Joshua 1.9. So it takes courage to believe God. It takes courage to obey God. And here's the last one. Joshua 1.9. <clears throat> Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee, can't you hear God just saying this to you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Lastly, it takes courage to rest in God's word easy to get nervous. It's easy to get vexed. I, I, I bleed like you. I'm not a superhero. It's easy to kind of get overwhelmed. It's easy to kind of like just get afraid. He says, hey, rest. I know you're running a race, but you can rest while you run. If you just trust me and know I got you, you could rest. It takes courage to rest while you run. It takes courage to have confidence to work and strive and do all the things God says to do, but still the confidence that the Lord's got this. The Lord's taking care of this. That takes some confidence. So those are some great exhortations right at the beginning about courage. But look at verse number 1 of Joshua. Let's look at some truths now. Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Now after the death of Moses. You see how the book of Joshua starts? Now after the death of Moses. Because Israel goes into the promised land under Joshua, not Moses. So you say, what is that a picture of? Why does God start the book that way? Well, you want to write a verse down. Acts chapter 7, verse 45. In Acts chapter 7, verse number 45, the Lord is, uh, Stephen is giving the history of Israel, and he calls Joshua Jesus. Right? I mean, we could flip there if we want. I guess we could hold a spot and flip there. We're going to be right back in, uh, if you want to see it yourself. 745, 745, Stephen is preaching and he says, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out. He's talking about them, you know, going into the wilderness and doing all that stuff they did in the book of Joshua. And he refers to Joshua as Jesus because only Jesus can take you to a place of victory. Only Jesus can take you to a place of blessing. And Moses represents what? Moses represents the law. And you know what the Bible says about you and the law? that you are dead to the law by the body of Christ, Romans chapter 7. So you don't get to the place of victory or blessing by the law. You get there through Jesus. God's not making a mistake when he calls Joshua Jesus. Look at, uh, don't look at anything. Um, doctrinally, though, that's, that's a nice truth. But doctrinally, Israel does not enter into her rest till after the death of Moses, right? Revelation eleven seven. Moses dies near the end of the Great Tribulation. Gets his head cut off. 
Revelation 11, 7, read it. The Antichrist takes his head off and Jesus Christ comes back, Joshua, to actually take them into the promised land. See, Moses dies, Jesus takes them in in the future. And in the past, right, Moses dies in the wilderness. We read it last week in Deuteronomy and Joshua, the next book, takes them in. God wrote the Bible. <laughs> see, when you're learning your Bible, you got to start to see the patterns. Because when you start to see the patterns, you could start to like put the pieces together and connect the dots. And so that's a beautiful picture right there. Look at 1-3. Let me show you something great. Oh, and, and inspirationally, how about us right here? You know what this means for us inspirationally, spiritually, devotionally, all that heart stuff that we need? You can't law yourself to victory. Can't discipline yourself, can't keep the commandments to do that. You know what you need? You need the power of Jesus Christ working through you. You need to mortify your flesh, yield to the Holy Spirit of God, and let Him work through you. And Jesus working through you can give you the victory. Victory is not, I'm never going to curse again. I'm never going to think an evil thought again. I'm just going to, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. No, if that couldn't save you, that can't help you. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, mortify your flesh, live unto Christ. Romans 7 says you're dead. Romans 8 says you could live through Jesus Christ now, this new life. Let that new beginning, that new Savior, work His life out in you by just yielding. Get out of His way. Say, Lord, when that Holy Spirit sticks you and says, don't do that, yield. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit says, do that, yield. And you practice yielding, that's how you walk in the Spirit. It's not like, I'm in the spirit today. I'm, I'm going to hum tie, I'm bow tie, I'm bow tie. No, that's not walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit is give that person a track. I don't want to, Lord. They look mean. <laughs> they got tattoos and scary face and, you know, his breath smells. Give that person a track. Okay. Hmm. Hey, man, how you doing? Oh, thanks, man. That's a really cool comic book. Right? You never know what you get when you give somebody a track. That's how you yield. Right, you're fighting with your spouse. That never happens with this group, I know. But let's say somebody else somewhere is having an argument with his or, his or her spouse. You know what? Holy Spirit says, shut up. Stop talking. Stop talking. Stop throwing coals on the fire. And, I'm going to show her. I'm going to show him. Holy Spirit says, stop. Yield. And as you yield, that's how you walk in the Spirit. And that's how Jesus Christ inside of you starts to live out his best life through you, and that's how you get to that place of victory and blessing. But look at verse 3. This is great, verse 3. Look what the Lord tells him before Joshua did anything. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. That's amazing, folks. Because you know what that is? That is God giving you the victory before it even happens. That's God giving Joshua, Jesus, the victory and saying, hey, Joshua, you've already won. And Christians, if you mortify your flesh and let Jesus Christ work out his life in you, guess what? You've already won because the victory has already been secured in Jesus Christ. That's why he could go out on a limb and say, hey, you're going to win, Joshua. Joshua never lost a battle, right? He's a picture of Christ who can give you the victory that we sing about. Oh, victory in Jesus. That's a great truth at the beginning of the book of Joshua. Let's go to chapter 2. Now, in chapters 2 to 6, we start getting ready to cross Jordan and get ready for battle. And next week we're going to talk about how important it is to cross Jordan. But look at uh, chapter 2 is Joshua sending the two spies into the land. And those two spies are a picture of Moses and Elijah sent into the world in the Great Tribulation, right? He sends two spies into the, world, into the land and he's going to send Moses and Elijah into the Great Tribulation. And in verse number 18, I want to show you something. Watch what happens. Here's how Rahab, that harlot, gets saved. Right, uh, Joshua 2.18. Behold, the spies tell her, When we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. Rahab the harlot, she was a lady of ill repute. Rahab the harlot and her whole house were saved because of a scarlet thread. Amen. Know what it's a great picture of? Salvation. 
Now, I'm holding my imaginary thread here. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know what that thread points to? Like a threefold cord? It picks to, points to what the Trinity does in your salvation. Why you're delivered. You want to look at it? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Let's look at the book on spiritual warfare. Ephesians 1. Let's look at that. And let's look at the threefold cord that's hanging in your life that got you escape, that gave you deliverance. Ephesians 1. Let's look at what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all do to make your salvation so sure that it's a rock. Ephesians chapter 1. Ready? Let's look at it. Ephesians 1 3. Here's God the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And when you read that verse, all the Calvinists lean in. Now, ready to tell me I told you so. No, the Bible says right there that God the Father's role was to choose you in Christ. He didn't just choose you. The word in Him are the key words in there. He chose you in Christ. He said, everybody that gets into Christ is going to get my salvation. He chose you in Christ. So sorry, John Calvin, you missed it again by about a mile, right? He chose you in Christ. You didn't get into Christ. When did you get in Christ? When you got saved, you didn't get into Christ in eternity past. Because if you were in eternity past, you were in Christ, and then you got out of Christ, and got into Adam, and then had to get back into Christ when you got saved. That doesn't work, Johnny. That doesn't work, man. You got to go back to Switzerland and do something else. That doesn't work, right? You, got, you were born in Adam. God knew everybody that gets into Christ will get saved. And then at some point in time... You called on Jesus Christ and God took you out of Adam, put you into Christ, and you are a new creature. That's something the Father chose to do. That was His role. But look at verse number 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. What did God the Son do? God the Father chose you in Christ, but God the Son redeemed you by His blood. He took on that flesh and He shed His blood, praise the Lord. And what did the Holy Spirit do? Verse number 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God the Father chose you in Christ, God the Son redeemed you by His blood, and God the Holy Spirit sealed you unto the day of redemption. That's a pretty good cord. That's a threefold cord that is not quickly broken. That is the thread that was a picture hanging in Rahab's window right there in our house. Let's go to Joshua chapter 3. Um, moving right along here. Joshua chapter 3. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 3. Now Joshua 3 and 4 really get into the crossing of Jordan. And uh, crossing Jordan is really about getting to God's promised land in your life. You know, really wish I had my whiteboard. I feel like I'm, I keep turning. If you see me keep turning, it's because like I'm having a Pavlovian response here. I'm like, idea, I want to turn around. But there are two great crossings in the people of God in the Old Testament. First one is the Red Sea. Their exodus from Egypt. Their exodus or their escape from the world. That's a picture of salvation. How many people have, are saved here tonight? I'd be really shocked if you weren't. I'd be impressed, right? right? That's a picture of salvation. That's the first crossing. A lot of people do the first crossing. But the second crossing is at the River Jordan. And the second crossing is not about the exodus from the world. It's about the entrance into the promised land. The exodus from Egypt is a picture of salvation through the Red Sea. The entrance into the promised land is a picture of sanctification. It's a picture of you getting to that place of blessing and getting to that place of victory. Now you say, how do you get into Jordan? Well, let's go back over the crossings. At the Red Sea, 
Moses did everything. They did nothing. They just walked through what Moses had already done. Right? The Bible says in Exodus chapter 4 that Moses was instead of God. He was a picture of God the Father. And when he lifted up those hands and he did that, guess what? The waters parted. He did all the work. And all those people had to do was just walk through that thing by faith, knowing that he would hold the waters back and make it to the other side. That's a picture of salvation. You know who did all the work? God did all the work. All you had to do was by faith just take that step and just enter into what God had already done. That's a blessing. But at the River Jordan, the priests and the Israelites, they had to do something. It wasn't just going to open up by itself. They had to do something, and their work and their effort and their courage would part those waters so they could get to the promised land. Do you see the picture? Salvation is all God's work, but you getting victory and blessing and all that higher ground, guess what? You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to put some feet to some prayers. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to read. You're going to have to consecrate yourself. You're going to have to put some effort in to make it to the promised land. That's the second crossing because you're a believer priest. The priest had to do some stuff. You're a believer priest now. You want to see what they had to do? There's four things that they had to do right in the book of Joshua chapter 3. Very instructive, a great lesson, practical lesson in Joshua 3. Here's the first thing they had to do in verse number 5. It really is like God wrote the Bible. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves. First thing you got to do, you want to get to the promised land? You got to get clean. You got to clean up your vessel, Israelites. You got to get some of the gunk out of yourself. That's what sanctify is, right? Get the good stuff out, put the, get the bad stuff out, get the good stuff in. That's the first thing. Want to see the second thing? Jump to verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests. So you know what those priests had to do? They had to step out by faith. That was the second thing they had to do. You had to sanctify yourself. You had to clean up your vessel, clean up your life, live holy before God. And number two, you want to get to the promised land? You're going to have to take a step into that water, and then it will part. Not like Moses in the Red Sea. They parted it before them, and they walked through on dry ground. Now it says you're going to have to take a step into that river, and then God will part it for you. But I'm not parting it if you don't take a step of faith. You're going to have to step out by faith, brethren. You're going to have to put some feet to what you and I profess. Oh, I'm praying for my aunt. I want my aunt to get saved. I want my aunt to get saved. Oh, God, please save my aunt. Holy Spirit says, witness to her. Oh, God, I just want my aunt to get saved. Give her a track. I'm just praying. Write her a letter. Send her a card. Do something. Oh, I just wanted to get saved. God's not going to get the gospel to that girl, that lady, the way you're praying. He's telling you, you do it. Take that step, and then I'll part the sea, and I'll open that door of utterance for you. But when he's telling you to do something, you've got to put some feet to those prayers. Keep reading. Look at 13. As soon as the soles of the feet of the priest that bear the ark... You know what else you got to do as a Christian to make it to the promised land? You got to sanctify yourself. You got to step out by faith and you got to stay with the stuff. Right? They were bearing the ark. They were holding forth the things of God and carrying those precious things of God through the wilderness. They didn't carry any ark through the Red Sea. They didn't have anything precious from God before when they were in Egypt. But now that you got some precious things from God that I've laid up for you, you know what you're supposed to do? Hold them up, magnify them, exalt them, support them, bear them, carry them in this wicked world so others can see it. That's a great picture of you and I. You didn't know anything about God before you were saved, right? You knew He was there, maybe, sort of. Do you know anything about God now? Has He given you anything precious about His golden pot of manna, about His Word? Or how about the rod that budded and His eternal priesthood? How about those tables of stone and His, and his law, right? There's some things laid up in that ark to point to great truths that you hold as a Christian. You know what you're supposed to do? Hold them forth! Hold them forth! And then you'll make it to the promised land. Keep reading, and the last thing it says, that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. 
What do you got to do to make it to the promised land? Number one, sanctify yourselves. Number two, step out by faith. Number three, stay with the stuff. And number four, stand firm on dry ground. He says, rest right there. Stand firm. Be steadfast, immovable. So many Christians are like unstable. <laughs> you know, they're all over the place. I believe this this week. I'm in church next week. I'm over here next month. I'm over here. God says, you need to get rooted and built up in Him. And then you'll get to the promised land. These Christians that are waffling, these Christians that are in church one month, out of church the next month, here one day, you're never going to get any victory. You get a Jesus buzz once in a while. That's nice. I'll see you at the next picnic. But you're not going to really get to where God could get you to some place of higher ground. Don't you want to be up in the promised land? I want to get all God has for me. I don't want like the little crumbs. I want to sit at the table. I want to put my head on his breast at supper. How come only John got that? Everybody could have gotten that. It just depends on how much you want it. You got to want it. You got to want him enough to say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm challenging you to be that person tonight. So those are some practical things about crossing Jordan. Now go to chapter 4 of Joshua. Of Joshua. Now doctrinally, here's where we might need our map soon. Doctrinally, Jesus will cross Jordan at the second coming. Yeah. He's going to go over Jordan again. Right at the spot where he was baptized. Joshua 4, let's go to verse 5. Joshua 4, 5. So they've, they've crossed over. And it says, uh, And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So picture the scene, right? When they crossed Jordan, what they do? Each tribe took a stone out for a memorial, and they stacked it, I guess, or made some kind of pillar or something outside the river Jordan, right? Those stones were a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because they went down into the water and took it up out of the water and it's left there as a memorial to remember forever, it says. Now go to Matthew chapter 3. Jesus Christ shows up to get baptized at the River Jordan. You know it was probably still there? Or you know what? Not probably. You know it was still there? Those stones. And look what it says in Matthew chapter 3. Look what John the Baptist says just to kind of prove the point that Jesus Christ is baptized right where Joshua crossed the River Jordan. Guarantee, the Bible is never wrong. Right, that's where you got to see the patterns. Now look at Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 7, ready? This is John the Baptist speaking. Look at the, the interesting wording here. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, this is John speaking, right? O generation of vipers, <laughs> you thought I was mean, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He didn't just say stones. He said, that's a demonstrative pronoun. You want me to go English teacher on you? That means it's right there. Not book, these books, right? That means they're right there. So where he's standing on the River Jordan, where Jesus Christ is about to show up and get baptized, he says, these stones, the ones we took out of the river, the ones that were supposed to be a memorial forever, that God was going to take us to the promised land, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, because he's coming to take us in again. And if you, think you, you don't think you need them, he could take these stones that are supposed to remind you of what Joshua did and what Joshua is going to do again. See, the Bible, is, the Bible is, it's all there if we just slow down and look at it. And, and that crossing of Jordan is part of the path of the second advent of Christ. If you flip over your handout, um, I'll talk about this again in a little bit, but you'll see right, uh, sorry at home, you don't have a handout, I apologize. Uh, 
But uh, that crossing of Jordan right there is right at the end. You'll see that little dotted line is that little path at that second advent. And you'll see he crosses Jordan again and starts to head towards Jerusalem. So it's part of his path. Jesus, Joshua crossed Jordan in the past, and he's going to cross it again in the future. So let's go back to Joshua. we just got a couple of chapters left, and I'm hurrying right along here. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. I'll tell you what those verses are. They didn't copy so well, so I'll, I'll read them out in a little bit, so you want to write them in on your handout. Joshua 5. You say, that's in the Bible? Yeah, that's in the Bible. Where he comes, where he's going to land, where he's going to move, it's all there. Joshua chapter 5 is about Gilgal. Gilgal. The rolling away of the past. They've crossed Jordan. They're getting ready to fight the battle. They're getting ready to go in there and battle Jericho. Great walled city. And it says in Joshua 5, 8, And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. After they cross Jordan and before they fight in Jericho, Joshua gives Israel, that second generation, a new beginning. They get circumcised. They weren't circumcised before. Remember, this is the second generation now. The old generation that was with Moses had been circumcised. They died out. Now we have this new generation, and now he circumcises them before they head into Jericho, signifying this is going to be a new beginning for you, second generation. Here's your chance. And in verse number 9, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt, from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Gilgal means a rolling away. You see this picture? God says, you're ready to get all I have for you. You're ready for the promised land. I'm going to give you this new beginning and I'm going to roll away all that reproach that you had. That's a beautiful picture. Because when you're ready, to, you know what? When you're ready to go to that next level with God and then next level for God and then next level with God, you know what he's going to do? He's going to say, listen, let's just roll away all that past. Let's just roll away all those mistakes. You know what Gilgal mentions before Jericho or what Gilgal pictures before Jericho? Spiritual maturity. A place where you are done with Egypt. You're done with the world. You ain't going into the promised land until you're done with the world. You got to be done. Done. You can't fight the battle of Jericho, uh, Jericho until you've decided to stop looking back. You know what the failure of the first generation was that died in the wilderness? They were always looking back. I'm thirsty. <laughs> Egypt. I'm hungry. Remember what we had in Egypt? They were always looking back. They were never fully committed. And when it was time for them to go through by, by Kadesh Barnea, their faith failed because they were double-minded. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God says, you want to go to the promised land? Stop looking back. Roll away the reproach of Egypt. Forget about Egypt. Forget about the world. And let's go forward. That's a challenge, Christians. That's a challenge to me. I don't know if that's a challenge to you. Because God said, if you're always looking back at what you used to have and what you could have had, if you just hung out with the old friends or stayed with the old girl, whatever it was, God says, you're never getting to higher ground because you're always like this. God says, go forward. Can't get to the promised land until you come to Gilgal and stop looking back. I hope you stop looking back. If you're at home today, stop looking back. Stop look. There's nothing good back there for you. Just slavery and bond. Oh, they had leeks and onions. Wow. But they had whips and chains. They forgot the whips and the chains when they got hungry for the leeks and the onions. Remember the, the whips and the chains. Now go to chapter 5, verse 13. We're right in the neighborhood. Please notice now, he's ready now. You see this? This is a monumental moment. We're crossing in now. We're going to fight the Battle of Jericho. Right? The walls are going to come tumbling down. Right? I should have told Joshua to bring a trumpet, bring the shofar, right? Walk around the library seven times, all the, all the books would have fallen off the shelves. But you know what? Joshua meets the captain of the Lord's host now. He meets Jesus Christ as a warrior. Joshua 5.13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man, hello, over against him with his sword drawn. 
in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Right? And Joshua, he knew who he was talking to now. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Only God gets worship. And did worship, because Jesus Christ is God. And did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. This is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Galatians 4 tells us that Jesus Christ would appear in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, an appearance of the Lord, right? And uh, verse 15, please notice, he asks Joshua to take off his shoes. That only happened two times in the Old Testament. Once at Mount Sinai, the burning bush, and here, right before they go into Jericho. Why is that significant? Because those two times mark the start and the end of his path at the second advent. See it? This is what I want to show you here, right? If you could see it right there. The first time that he's told to take off his shoes because it's holy ground is Mount Sinai. There's your, the, the verse that I have written underneath that is Exodus 3.5. That's where it happens. And where it's going to happen again is Deuteronomy 33, verses 1 to 3. God comes down from the north. He comes down to Sinai like he did in the past. He comes down in the future. He doesn't touch down at Sinai, but he comes down at Sinai. And then he starts to come up through the wilderness. That verse right there is Song of Solomon 3.6 where that beloved is saying, who is this that cometh out of the wilderness? Just like the Jews came out of the wilderness and followed that pillar of fire and that cloudy pillar, guess what? They're gonna come out of, he's going to come out of the wilderness, and then he's going to head up the king's highway into Edom over here. That's uh, Judges chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. And Psalm 68 talks about it. And then right up next to Bozrah is Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah talks about who is this that cometh from Bozrah with dyed garments, right? Because he's uh, covered in blood, right? He's coming up there. And Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 talks about him coming from Teman and Paran, those places in Edom and Seir. And he comes up right by the Jordan River, crosses over by Gilgal, and heads into Jericho, just heading towards Jerusalem. So he tells him at the beginning, take off your shoes, and at the end, take off your shoes, because that bookmarks the start and the end of this path of the second advent. And the path ends right over there. Now let's go to the Battle of Jericho, chapter 6. Two stops left. Chapter 6, the Battle of Jericho, a picture of Israel in the Great Tribulation. The Battle of Jericho. I, don't, I find the Bible so fascinating. I mean, don't you? I mean, it's like, whoa. You know, I'm like, you know, I've got guys that I've learned this stuff from. I, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to understand it myself and see things that I'm seeing. And it's just like, it really makes you stand in awe a little bit. Just like, this is no, like, cunningly devised fable. I've read the Quran, parts of it. I've read some of, like, the you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh and some of this other stuff that the world says is just like the Bible. Oh, no, I don't think so. No, 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 never man spake like this man. You know, you read, you read about the, you know, the, the universe sitting on the back of a giant turtle swimming in a galaxy of milk. That's what you read about in some of this, you know, Eastern literature. That stuff is like weird, like fairy tale mysticism. This is like, he's going to be here, then he's going to go there, and this is going to happen here. It's got names and places of areas that exist to this day. Josh, you saw the Valley of Megiddo, right? You can go to the Valley of Megiddo and see, wow, this would make a really good spot to get whacked in, and the blood's going to be running for like some miles over here. I forget the exact number. So these are places. Joseph Smith, he was pulling stuff out of his hat, literally. He's talking about places that don't exist. He's talking about places in the Mormon, Mormon, whatever, pantheon, Mormon mythos, places that historians are like, sorry, um, that there's no such thing as a Nephite. We don't know what a Lamanite is, but we know what an Israelite is. And archaeologists can take the Bible and like use it to navigate the Middle East, 
right? Because your Bible is not a cunningly devised fable. It's a book of fact and history, and it's something we got to lay hold of. Now, the Battle of Jericho is this great picture. What are some things? Verse 4. Verse 4, we got seven trumpets. What do we have in Revelation 8 to 11? We got seven trumpets of judgment in the tribulation. Verse 17, how about this? It says, and the city shall be accursed. You know what? The city is called accursed, just like the devil's city Babylon is cursed and destroyed in Revelation 17 to 18. But here's a good little nugget. This one I'm sure is just an accident. So the sixth book of the Bible is Joshua, right? Now we're in chapter 6, right? So the sixth verse would be like 6, 6, 6, right? So sixth book, sixth chapter, sixth verse would be your 666 of your Bible. You want to see what happens right before 666 in your Bible? In 665, right? You want to see it? In verse number 5 of chapter 6 of the sixth book. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout, with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up, <laughs> every man straight before him. I'm sure there's just an accident that right before 666, there is a shout, and the people of God ascend up. Because right before 666 is going to get ready to really take over the scene, guess what? There's going to be a shout, and if you're saved, the people of God are going to ascend up. Right? Again, I'm sure that's just an accident. I'm sure some scribal error somewhere caused this to happen. Or we know the truth. God wrote the Bible. And God was behind the preservation and the translation of this Bible because the Greek and the Hebrew didn't have verse and chapter numberings. Amen. So where do you get that? That's some progressive revelation, folks. That's God still doing some work. Now let's go to chapter 7. Are you going up? Let me hear an amen. amen. All right, well, let's get ready to shout. Last verse, we'll, we'll stop in chapter 7. Because as great as Jericho is, and as mighty as that victory is, and as much as maybe you got goosebumps like I did, thinking about ascending up straight before him after a great shout, chapter 7 is the battle of Ai and Achan's sin. Jericho was a fortress, and they whacked it without lifting a spear. Ai was like was like Iran today. It was like a little, like a little third world country, you know? I mean, isn't it crazy how today we stood up to communist Russia in the Cold War, and now we got countries that don't have enough money to make gasoline or feed their people, has America quaking? Ooh, isn't that, you ever think about that? How God has removed his favor and the confidence we once had to stand up against Khrushchev, but who would push the button first? And we, you know, Gorbachev, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Like, you know, decades ago, America, when we were a little better off, I'm not saying all America, rah, 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 but a little better off, a little more righteous, there was some confidence to stand up to great enemies. Now, people in the shadows and in caves got us worried sick. When you're right with God, you know what? You have some confidence. When you're not right with God, oh, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, right? But the righteous are bold as a lion. And here, they took out Jericho because they were right with God. Now, they're not right with God anymore. You know what? This little schmutz of a country named Ai, these people, send them running. Why? Well, look at chapter 618. 618. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Israel was told, don't touch anything from Jericho. It's all accursed. It's all wicked. Just leave it smoldering. Leave it in rubble. And brethren, there's a great truth there. If you want all God has for you, leave what God destroyed alone. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to see if there's anything that you could salvage. Just leave it alone. Leave it alone. But look what happens in chapter 7. Like a lot of believers, one man by the name of Achan, he just couldn't, tell, he couldn't help himself. He had, to get, he had to touch some. It looked so good he had to touch some of it. Please notice the steps down of Achan. This is a great Sunday school lesson for anybody here. A very great devotional here. Just Achan's steps down to the accursed thing. Ready? Verse 21. 
when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. You know what the first step down was? I saw. What are you looking at? Right? Like Eve saw the tree. Like I'm sure David saw Bathsheba shower, you know, bathing on the top of the roof. You know, he just was staring at those gold bars, staring at that silver, and mine eye affecteth mine heart, the Bible says, and you look at the wrong things too long, you know what happens? It starts working in there, and that person at work that you're talking to, that too comfortably, or that, you know, whatever it is, you know, you start, the mind starts turning, and you know, there's a little illumination, like Eve saw the tree, you start saying, oh, that looks pretty good, she looks pretty good, he looks pretty good, that looks pretty good, you know what? And you look too long, and the mind starts turning. First step down. Second step down. He says, next, I saw, then I coveted them. Because your eye affects your heart. Now it's like, I want that. I want him. I want her. I want this. I want. You know what? You look long enough, you start wanting. Your body moves in the direction of your head, right? Nobody runs a race like this, <laughs> right? Right? You run in the direction of your head, right? The head goes this way. Hey, I did diving back in the day when I was like, 80 years ago when I was 15, right? I was on the diving team, don't laugh at me. But you know what they said? Your body's gonna follow your head. You need to do that double and a half or that one and a half, whatever it is. You gotta throw your head and your body will follow your head. And your body follows your head. If your eyes are like looking over here, guess what? Everything's gonna start following that. I saw and I coveted. Number three, third step down. And took them. Illumination, meditation, action. You see it, Eve saw the tree, thought about it, took it, right? David saw Bathsheba, thought about it, went after her. He saw the gold and silver, thought about it, took it. That's the third step down. You touch the unclean thing, but here's the worst part, I think. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. You know what the worst thing is? I hid it. Now you try to cover your sin, which is the biggest mistake. Can you hold your place there? We've got just two stops left. Proverbs chapter 28. Can you go there, Proverbs 28? We're going to make mistakes in the flesh. You know, we're trying to get the sin out of our lives. We're going to scump, stumble and scratch, you know, scrape our knees, so to speak. You know what you're supposed to do when you make a mistake? Don't hide your sin. Don't try to cover it. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says... He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Listen, when you sin, the only way to succeed after you stumble is to make it right with God. The old timers used to say, keep short accounts with God. Don't let things build up. You make a mistake, Lord, forgive me, I want, that's under the blood, confess it, forsake it, Lord, help me not to do that again. Just keep, get, keep getting victory over those things. Don't just let it pile up. It's like a relationship with your spouse, right? You have a fight. Worst thing to do is just to not talk to each other. One day pass, two day pass. That doesn't make it better. That just makes it worse. It'd be better to just stop and say, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, and make it right. Now, God doesn't have to apologize to you, but I got to apologize to him. And it's not, I shouldn't run around in my, run to my room and shut the door on God. Lord, I screwed up. Lord, forgive me. This is what I did. He's like, I know, but you got to restore that fellowship. You see? A lot of Christians don't want to do that, and that's why you never prosper. It's, you, the test of a man is not how hard you get hit. It's how hard you can get hit and keep coming. I think Rocky Balboa said that, so it's got to be good, right? It's not that you're not going to fall down. It's what do you do when you stumble, right? Christians are going to make mistakes, but get up, make right with God, and go on. Don't just wallow in it. Oh, I'm out of church now, and I'm not going to read my Bible now. That's so dumb. That's like the dumbest thing in the world to do. I love you at home, but that's just really dumb. Go back to Joshua 7. So let's look at... This last thought, and this one I'll try not to knock the camera over. But the last thought that this chapter teaches us is something we all got to get. All right, soldiers? Achan's sin affected a lot of other people for the worse. And your sin doesn't just affect you. You want to see who it affected? Look at Joshua chapter 7, verse 4. 
So there went up hither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. First person it affects, it affected some innocent soldiers trying to fight for the Lord. They were going to try to do a great thing for God and take this city, and those soldiers ran away and thirty-six of them got killed. Why? Because you weren't right with God, Achan, and you polluted the camp. It hurt some soldiers. You know who else it hurt? Verse 13. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. You know who else it affected? It affects the whole congregation when there's sin in the camp. It's Achan made the mistake, but God's talking to all of them. He says, you guys are a unit. You guys are an army. You guys are in this thing together. If one of you has messed around, you've all messed around. If one of you screwed up, you've all screwed up. You guys got to make it right together. That's a great lesson for a church. Because you know what? Your sin doesn't just stop with you. It affects the whole congregation. It could put an icy pall over a Sunday morning. It can grieve the Holy Spirit of God in the congregation. Man, it's like... I don't even want to experience that. I've experienced it. But it's wicked to live selfish and think like, well, I'm just doing my own thing. No, you hurt the whole church when you go and do your nonsense. So if not just for you and the Lord, at least have some consideration for the brethren. right? So you know what? We can't go out to battle because God looks at us as a family, as an army together. We've got to like watch each other's backs and shoulder up and be on the same page with this stuff. You know what else it affects? Verse 7. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. You know what else it affected? It affected the leadership. They get discouraged too. Right? The, Joshua is just like, Oy vey, you know, he's just like, like, you know, why'd we even do this, right? You know what? The leaders, pastors, deacons, you know what? We bleed as well. And when people are living like pigs and people are just like, you know, to God and just like in and out and like just that sin falls on the church, you know what? It grieves you. It makes you be like, oh, sometimes I wish I never did this. You know, that's sometimes what Joshua is saying right there. And I can't confess that that thought, you know, never flies through your mind. Man, I wish I never did this. I wish I never... <laughs> Not a lot, but I can't lie and say it doesn't ever just pop up in your head because it grieves you. You invest in people, you invest in people, you go in the wilderness with them, and then they're just like, peace out, home slice. <laughs> this girl's cute. <laughs> or peace out, home slice. I'm going to be an idiot over here. Or peace out, you know, I'll see you when I need you. I'll see you when, you know, the hospital thing happens or the, somebody dies. You know, that's when, I'll, that's when I'll get a call. And you know what that does? It's... It's grieving. It's discouraging. Joshua is discouraged. Verse number 24. I wish I was a superhero and said I never got discouraged. But then my nose would grow about as, would hit the window if, if I said that. Verse 24. You know what else is discouraged? I'm just about done here. You know what else is discouraged? Or else it messed with? It affected? It affected his family. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achar, and they kill him. Are you willing to destroy your family over your stupid sin? I hope not. He had corrupted his whole family. They weren't innocent. They had been corrupted by Achan's bad example, and they're all corrupted. And Joshua says, we've got to put you all out. We've got we to eliminate all of you. And Achan, who should have been setting the pace, actually spelled their destruction. And then finally, verse 25. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Finally, it affected Achan himself. His brethren, you are going to pay the price. In this life or the next. You're not going to go to hell if you're saved, but you're going to pay the price. You're going to lose something. The wages of sin is death. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 
And some people, some professing Christians, I don't know anybody's heart, but some professing, professing Christians are prancing around and thumbing their nose at God. I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be around them because I don't want to be there when the lightning strikes. And some men's sins are open beforehand going forth to judgment. Some people get judged in this life and some men they follow after. And sometimes, you know what, somebody lives like an idiot for 20, 30 years, and you know what, you don't see God drop the hammer, but payday's coming someday. God's going to settle the score, and I don't want to be there when it happens, right? So if that's you, talking, you know, generally, not you specifically, but if you're thumbing your nose at God and going on like a pig, thinking everything's great, I'm great, money's in the bank, you know, coffee's in my hand, uh, you know, music's blaring in the background, everybody's doing great, everything's great, if that's you... And you think you could just go on and God's not going to ever have you reap what you sow. I'm keeping further than six feet. I'm keeping like six miles. Because when the lightning strikes, behold the goodness and the severity of God. When you scorn His goodness, His severity, some scary stuff, man. You read about Treblinka and Auschwitz and Dachau and how God can lay the severity on a people and have them go through things that you can't even repeat sometimes. I won't be anywhere near that stuff. Nobody wants it to happen. But the point I want to finish up with is this. Sin never affects just you. Your sin affects you and everyone around you. Your church, your family, your spouse, your marriage, your people at work, it affects you. When you're right with God, they're better for it. When you're wrong with God, they're worse for it. And no way around that. That's a Bible principle and a Bible truth. The Bible says in Romans 14, No man liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. No man is an island, John, Den John Donne wrote in the 1600s in that poem of his. No man is an island. You affect me and I affect you. We're a body. So sober up and ask yourself, are you helping somebody get to the promised land? Or are you hindering somebody from getting to the promised land? The choice is yours because your sin affects others. That's chapters 1 to 7. Let's have a word of prayer, okay? Lord, we thank you today. We praise you today. We just bless you for these great truths, Father. We pray that they help your people, Lord, challenge us. Lord, give us courage. Help us to get rid of sin. Help us, Lord, to be all you want us to be, Lord. Get the glory out of us, Father. We love you, and we thank you, Lord. Just give us some unction at the fairs, Lord. Give us boldness in our daily lives with our families. Help us, Lord, every step of the way just to go further for you.